Hey, good morning. Let me welcome you to our services this morning at Highland Park Baptist Church. This is Sunday number six that we've been doing all of our worship services, uh, virtual, online. And so, uh, you know, our hopes were it wouldn't take this long. But uh, the reality is it's probably going to take a little bit longer. Folks ask me all week, they say, Pastor, when are we going to start getting to gather back together again in person and worship together and do Bible study together? Uh, right now, we just don't know. We just don't know. And so we want to continue to uh, uh, follow those that are in leadership, those that God has allowed to uh, you know, be in the positions that they're in as far as national and state and local leaders. We want to also be a good neighbor, and we never want to do anything that is going to potentially put you in danger. So I guess the best way to answer the question of when will we get to gather back together in our buildings, in or on our campuses, is uh, I think when phase two happens, that'll kind of open some things up and we'll be able to start gathering together. It's going to be different than it was before. We won't be able to meet in such large groups as we did before. We're still working all that out, but just as soon as we can do that, I promise you, I'll let you know there's nobody that misses being able to gather together uh, and see faces than I do. I can promise you that. Also, I want to make an announcement before we go any further in our service today, just to kind of let you know, because a lot of you have students or you have children, and uh, they're a actively involved in our uh, different programs that we have here at our church. And summertime is a very busy time where we do a lot of traveling with camps and vacation Bible school, all those kinds of things. We are not going to be doing any traveling as a church until after July the 30th. That would be the earliest. So the 1st of August would be the very earliest that we could do any traveling. So that means there won't be any summer camps. Most of your camp places have already canceled camps this summer anyway. So for those of you that are trying to figure out how the summer is going to work out, just to let you know, and you'll hear more from Tammy and Robbie about that uh, as well, but uh, that way you can figure it out, okay? But let me welcome you here to our services today. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and we've got the camera flipped around backwards like we did last week, so you kind of get an idea of what this place looks like, but we are live. This is not recorded right here Sunday morning, Panama City, Florida. I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer. Corey's going to come. He's going to lead us in some praise and worship, and then I'll come back and we'll study the Bible together. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Thank you, Lord, for the love that you have for us. Thank you, Lord, that even though we find ourselves in, uh, well, in times that we never saw coming, thank you, Lord, that you knew long before anything ever took place that we would be doing what we're doing today. And by that, we bring, uh, well, through that, we find comfort, and through that, we find hope. And Lord Jesus, today, we exalt your name because your name is the only name that is worthy to be exalted. You're the only one that is alive and died to be risen to death, never to taste death again. And because of that, today, what a glorious hope we have that even though one day we will all face death, that for the follower of Christ, it's not the end. Thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Today, may you be pleased with our worship and praise, whether we're sitting right there in our living room, on our back porch, in our car, wherever we may be. We exalt the name of Jesus, for it is in his name we pray, amen. All right, so go ahead, stand to your feet, sit down your fruit loops, and get ready to praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The splendor of the King Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. And how great is our is our God, and all will see how great, and how great is our 
in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints with my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Come on, sing it to him this morning. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God, yeah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. thank you. God, that we can sing your praises. Lord, even in times such as this, God, where we're all separate, we're in our own homes, God, we can still lift you up. Lord, to magnify your name. Oh, God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, amen. If you got a Bible today, go ahead. 1 Kings chapter 19. It's what we're going to be looking at today. 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, maybe at one time or another, uh, you've come to a place where you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to throw in the towel. Uh, I've had enough. Uh, I'm ready to quit. Uh, I heard one time about this big city lawyer, and he came down south, and he was doing uh, some dove hunting. And so he, he shot his bird, and his bird fell, and it fell over in a pasture on the side of a fence. And so this lawyer was climbing over the fence to go retrieve his bird, and all of a sudden, uh, a farmer came pulling up on a tractor. And, and the farmer said, well, what do you think you're doing? And the lawyer said, well, I, I'm, I'm going to get my, my dove. I shot it, and it fell right here. And he said, no, you're not. This is my land. Get off my land. And the lawyer said, I don't think you know who I am. I, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer from New York City, and if you don't let me come over there and get my bird, I'm going to sue you for everything you got. And so the farmer said, okay, okay, settle down. How about we just settle this dispute the way that we would normally do down here in Alabama? Let's settle it by something we call the Bama three-kick rule. And the lawyer said, the Bama key th uh, you know, three-kick rule, I've never heard of that. Explain that to me. And the farmer said, well, it's pretty simple. Uh, I kick you three times, and then you kick me three times, and then I kick you three times, and on and so forth until one of us eventually gives up. And the lawyer looked at the old farmer, and he thought, golly, I am a lot younger. I'm a lot healthier than this guy. I, I know that I'm going to win this. He said, okay, let's do it. Then the Bama three-kick rule, let's settle it that way. And so as the lawyer was setting down his stuff, the farmer got off the tractor. He walked over. He took the end of his pointed boots and kicked him right in the shin. And as he bent down to grab his shin, all of a sudden, the farmer kicked him right in the midsection, and it took away his breath. And so as he's bent over, the farmer places his final kick right to the side of the lawyer's head, knocks him out. I mean, he's literally seeing stars, and he's just real wobbly. Finally, though, he gets better. He comes to his, you know, to his feet, and he thinks, you know what, now's my time. And he said, all right, you old coot, now it's my time to kick you. I'm going to show you how we kick in New York City. He started walking towards the farmer, and the farmer said, nah. I give up. You can go ahead and get your bird. <laughs> you ever felt that way before? Go ahead and laugh at home. I can hear you right here in the room, right? Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever been kicked down and you don't even get the opportunity to kick? 
That, that's how Elijah felt in our passage of Scripture today. A great prophet of God, he's down, he's out, he's been kicked, and he says, you know what, God, I, I'm tired of it all. I'm ready to throw in the towel. Let's read the passage of Scripture this morning in 1 Kings chapter 19. Let's just read the first five verses. We'll be skipping around the chapter, so go ahead and have your Bible there. And the Scripture will be on the screen as well. He says in verse 1 of 1 Kings 19, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose. He ran for his life. He went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But then he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came, and he sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. You ever been there? He prayed that he would die. Listen to what he said. It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And then as he lay and he slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Now, here's what I want you to do with me right there in your living room or wherever you're watching this today. I want you to try to imagine this great prophet of God sitting there under a solitary tree. Elijah had just had one of the greatest victories of his entire ministry, his entire life. And so in response to the prayers, God had caused fire to fall down from heaven. In response to Elijah's prayers, a famine that had been taking place over the land for three years had finally stopped. I'm just saying unbelievable victories. I know we sit there a lot of times and we say, man, I've had a great week. I've had a great run. Things have been going really, really good. None of us can sit there and say, you know what, I prayed God sent fire down. For, I, I, I prayed and the, uh, the famine was stopped. That's just what's happening in Elijah's life. Elijah should have been on top of the world. If there was ever a time that Elijah should have said, you know what, I can, I can kind of chill just a little bit because this is, I'm just going to bask in the victory. Yet we find him here in the depths of depression. He's even begging, as we read, begging God to kill him, let him die. He went from the mountaintop to the valley. Many of you know what that's like, don't you? To go from that mountaintop of happiness and all of a sudden you fall down into that valley of despair. I don't know, maybe you're listening to me today and you're like, you know what, that's me. I've never heard of this guy named Elijah, but I find myself in the very same place as Elijah was. You've lost all hope. You feel like quitting. Today we're going to discuss the reasons why people lose hope, but then we're also going to see instructions from God on how to restore our hope. So first of all, let's look at this despair of hopelessness. Uh, this is what Elijah found himself in. And I want you to realize that even committed followers of Jesus Christ sometimes find themselves dismayed. Uh, here, here was a prophet who was so discouraged, uh, I guess you could say he was ready for a non-profit existence, right? He was an emotional mess. Frustration had set in. Actually, Elijah had even gone beyond frustration. He was suffering from full-blown depression. Maybe you know that well. There are a lot of folks that suffer from full-blown depression Today, I was reading an article just a couple of days ago that talks about this isolation and, you know, not going to work and all those kinds of things, life being different as we see it, that depression is taking place among people at alarming rates, and yet we were already known as one of the most depressed cultures and societies in the world. It's easy to see why he wanted to quit. It's easy to see. It's the very same reason that makes people want to quit today as well. It's depression to make people want to give up today. What are the reasons that brought him to the point where he said, I'm just ready to throw in the towel? A couple of reasons. First of all, he was depleted physically. Elijah, the scripture, if you read before that, Elijah was running for his life. If you read what we read this morning, it says he ran all the way from Jezreel to Beersheba. 
You're like, well, that's kind of like a casual jog. It was 70 miles. When's the last time you're like, I'm going to take a casual jog for 70 miles? No, he was running with all his might because the queen made a promise to him, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to do with you what you did to the prophets of this false god Baal. He had already been exhausted from this confrontation that he had with not just one prophet of Baal, but 450 prophets of Baal. And so now he's sprinting for his life. You've got to know he's exhausted. And we're the very same way. Most of the time, I know it may not be right now, it may not be the last six weeks, but most of the time we're so exhausted from work and work and work until we get to the point to where uh, we're gritting our teeth and we're just, well, I got to work a little bit longer, I got to hit it a little bit harder, and I'm just, I'm already so exhausted and spent from all the things that have been taking place. Let's be honest, before this stay-at-home order and all that, most people's schedules were more hectic than ever before. Moms and dads so busy that they seldom have any time for their kids, let alone have time for each other. Maybe before six weeks ago, you could identify with this one hard-charging businessman who all of a sudden started having some chest pains, and reluctantly, he went into his doctor, and he said, Doc, my chest is hurting. I, I need to know uh, what to do. And here's what the doctor said, you're burning the candle at both ends, to which the businessman said, listen, Doc, I didn't come in here for a lecture. I want you to give me more wax. I want to keep going. When you do not get enough rest physically, then you are prone to discouragement. And that discouragement will lead to full-blown depression. He was depleted physically. But the second reason he was ready to throw in the towel, he was detached emotionally. We read that the queen Jezebel hated Elijah so much and was out to get him. But Elijah thought everybody was against him. Elijah thought everybody was out to get him. Matter of fact, if you look in verse 10, and then if you look in verse 14, it, he tells God that he is the only one, Elijah does, I'm the only one, God, that is still faithful to you. We might say it this way. Elijah was having a pity party, and he was having a pity party for just one, for himself. The devil will do that, won't he? See, there were folks out there that Elijah should have been going to for encouragement, going to for help, but instead he's like, oh, they're all out to get me as well. The devil wants to drive you away from the very people that can help you in your times of depression and in your times of discouragement. And what the devil will do is he'll shove you into fear and he'll shove you into paranoia. I heard somebody say one time that there are some folks that are so paranoid they won't even go to a football game because they think that the guys in the huddle are talking about them. Now, that's pretty paranoid, isn't it? We all have problems. Some are big problems. And some are little problems. You know the difference between a big problem and a little problem? A little problems, what you have. Big problems, what I have. Kind of like surgery. Major surgery is what I have. Minor surgery is what you have. That's how we all face situations. And a lot of times we, we want to isolate ourselves. And if you isolate yourself from others, you're like, I don't have an option here. The government says I have to isolate myself. No, friend, the government says you need to stay in your house. You need to be careful how you go out. They're doing this to keep the spreading of this terrible disease, this pandemic but it doesn't mean that you can't reach out to someone that it doesn't mean you can't text someone or call someone or you know just speak to someone across the fence and speak to someone in your family what happens is we want to sit there and instead say I'm the only one in this I'm the only nobody knows what I'm going through and all of a sudden you become an, an easy target for the devil's discouragement he was depleted physically he was detached emotionally he was a mess but I'll tell you the third reason he was ready to give up. He was deserted spiritually. And that's how it happens. The physical leads to the emotional, which in turn leads to the spiritual. Elijah had just experienced a wonderful spiritual high on Mount Carmel. Immediately after that. Now he is in a pit of despair and depression. 
I'm just saying, guys, it's so easy to find ourselves going from a peak to a pit. We see this happening all throughout the Bible. Sometimes you can be so involved with serving the Lord that you, know, you, you, you find yourself running on empty. It's been said that most preachers resign on Monday after pouring their hearts out on Sunday. You may not be a preacher today, but you understand what is being said. So don't be surprised if you find yourself kind of sagging just a little bit after you've had this mountaintop experience with the Lord. It's a very common thing that we see among Christ followers. So he's saying, watch out when you find yourself depleted physically. Watch out when you find yourself detached emotionally. Watch out when you find yourself uh, deserted spiritually because that's exactly the time that you'll find yourself wanting to quit, wanting to give up. And so that is the despair of hopelessness. It's the devil's cheap tool to get you to think that there is no better coming. There is no joy in the morning. There is no hope for the future. But here's what I love about God's Word. It not always, you know, it always not only gives us the problem, but then it turns around and says, here's how God brings hope and help and the answer. Let's look at the directions for regaining hope that he gives us in this passage of Scripture. See, Elijah wanted to quit. He wanted to give up. God wouldn't let him, and God's not going to let you either. God gave him three specific directions that are so simple. Yet when he did these things, he regained hope. What was the first direction? Get up. Get up. He says, get up. Look in verse 7 and 8 of 1 Kings chapter 19. So God sends this angel to Elijah. Here's what the angel says. He says, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. Let me, I want to stop and just say something before we read the passage any further. I was watching a television program just yesterday, and somebody in this program, they didn't have a relationship with the Lord, or every indication was that they didn't have a relationship with the Lord. And here's the comment that they made. They said, you know what? It's like my daddy always says, God will not put more on us than we can bear. My daughter said, Golly, you know, Dad, that is so wrong. That's so not in the Bible because, you know, not only do people who don't know Christ say that, but people who profess and do know Christ make that comment. Friend, understand, God will allow more to come on you than you can bear. He'll never allow more to come on you than he can bear. He will allow things to come on us that will drive us to our knees for we will understand the only hope that we have is found in Jesus Christ himself. And so in the passage of Scripture, the angel comes, the angel says, Arise and eat, the journey is too great for you. It's too great for you. It's not too great for God, but it's too great for you. So he arose. Listen to what it says. He arose and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights. If you find yourself this morning ready to quit, then you need to pay attention to your body. That's what we get from God's Word right here. God gave Elijah three things that we all need. First of all, he slept, then he ate, and then he exercised. Elijah was so exhausted for running for his life that he slept for two straight days. You ever been there? Some of you are like, well, that's where I am right now. He slept for two days. Friend, I'm just saying, if you're not getting enough rest, you'll develop what experts call a sleep debt. And a sleep debt is a debt that will eventually be paid. It'll either be paid by poor performance or it'll be paid by an emotional collapse. I'll tell you the best way to pay it is to get caught up on your sleep. Understand, God has designed this body to need rest. And so he slept for two days. He caught up on his sleep. And then it says God fed Elijah. When he woke up, notice what it says that an angel had prepared a cake for him. You like angel food cake? Oh, Elijah loved it that day. Some folks say that's the first reference that we see to angel cake. I don't know if that's true or not. But anyway, the angel made him a cake. And and then all of a sudden, God put Elijah on an exercise program. Had him walk for 40 days. He had run from Mount Carmel to Beersheba. But over the next 40 days, if you continue reading the passage of Scripture, Elijah is going to travel to Mount Horeb, which was in the Sinai Peninsula. 
So what happens when I feel as though I'm ready to quit? I'm ready to throw in the towel. I'm ready to forget uh, about all hope. I'm ready to just bury myself and say, you know what? I'm the only one. Nobody knows what I'm going through. The first thing we do is get up. Get up out of your pit. Get up out of wallowing in your own despair. Get up. Get enough sleep. Get something to eat. Exercise. Here's the second directive he gives him look up look up look at look in verse 11 with me flip flip over well you may not have to flip over i'm flipping in my bible if i want to read verse 11 in verse 11 and then he said go out and stand on the mountain before the lord and behold the lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. Now, if there's anybody that understands a strong wind, it is the folks of Bay County, Florida. Yeah, just a few days ago, right? Down through downtown area and other places. He says, a strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there came an earthquake. Oh, my goodness. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. So here is Elijah, been running for his life, finally gets where he believes God's told him to go. He's living in a cave, and all of a sudden, in in the course of just a little bit, there is a tornado, an earthquake, and a fire. And you think you got it bad. My, my. It says, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, fire. The Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, don't miss this, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle. That means his coat. He wrapped his face in his coat. And he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So after his sleeping, eating, and exercise program, Elijah arrived at Mount Horeb. He's there, living in a cave. And while he was living in a cave, God taught Elijah something about how to listen to God. God sends a tornado, God sends an earthquake, God sends a fire. Now, I want you to imagine with me for just a moment, if you will, uh, Elijah there, this great prophet of God that had just brought down 350 uh, prophets of the false idol Baal. And he's living there in that dark cave. You're straining to hear God speak. Oh, God, what, what do I do now? Oh, God, what do you want to happen in my life? And then suddenly you hear this powerful wind blowing, a tornado, and yet God's not speaking in the tornado. And then there's the rumble of a mighty earthquake, and God's not speaking in the earthquake. Matter of fact, it even says there that it dislodged and split some rocks. Boulders are flying around. Finally, there's this roaring fire that is taking place. You're trying to listen, yet all you're hearing is the crackle and the sizzle of the flames. After these colossal demonstrations, you hear a whisper, Elijah. And then again, you hear a whisper, Elijah. You walk to the mouth of that cave, and in a still, small quiet whisper again Elijah what are you doing see friend listen to me God wants to talk to you and it may be that there are so many tornadoes so many earthquakes so many noisy fires in your life that you can't hear his voice oh God is speaking the question is are you listening to what God is saying You may be trying to listen to the wind. You may be trying to listen uh, to the earthquake, and God is speaking softly and simply. God doesn't even have to use a voice like I'm using this morning. God instead many times chooses to communicate to us, to speak to us through our spirit. He also chooses to speak to us very clearly in his word, the Bible. Do you want God to speak to you? Do you want him to speak to you right now? Okay, if you do, he will. I promise. His word promises. 
If you seek the Lord, you will find the Lord if you seek him with all your heart. He is willing to speak to you. He has a word for you that if you'll just open up your heart, he will communicate with you. He wants to speak hope into the troubled mind that you have. He wants to bring healing to the distressed soul that is so easily anchoring you to despair. Here are his words for you, spoken directly in the Bible. Listen to what he says. This is in John 16, 33. Jesus speaking said, I've told you these things, that in me you might have peace. Don't you want peace for your troubled soul? He says, in the world you will have trouble. You said, when I hang on, I was watching a pastor or a preacher on TV, and he told me that if I had enough faith, I wouldn't have trouble. Can I give you something that's going to help you out tremendously? Don't listen to him anymore. The Bible says, in this life, you will have trouble. But take heart, Christ says, for I have overcome the world. See, according to Jesus Hope does not deny the reality of pain. Hope denies the finality of pain. <laughs> That's a bumper sticker right there, isn't it? Somebody make that up, sell it, and I'll only take 75% of that, right? Hope does not deny the reality of pain. It denies the finality of pain. So he says, get up. He says, look up. And then finally, listen to what he says. He says, link up. Again, Elijah thought he was all alone. Two times he said this, I'm the only one left who loves you, God, and they're even trying to kill me too. God gave him a reply. It was very direct. It was very specific. Look in verse 15. Look in verse 15 at the scripture. He says, anoint Hazael king over Syria. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, to succeed you as prophet. And then look down in verse 18. I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Here's what God just said in a way that only God could say it to Elijah. And he's saying it to you and I as well. He's saying, Elijah, you're throwing a pity party. And it's a pity party for one person. Elijah's ready to quit. He's ready to give up. Elijah, you aren't the only one, God says, who feels the way that you do. There are folks out there that, Elijah, you need them, and they need you too. You need to go. You need to link up with them. See, I think one of the biggest delusions that Satan brings when it comes to depression and discouragement and hopelessness is to get us to think that nobody knows the trouble I've seen. When, in fact, there are plenty of people out there that know exactly what you're going through. They themselves have, have, themselves have struggled with exactly what you are facing. And here's God's message to you today. You need them. They need link up with them. I've allowed them to be in your life so that you might be able to share your burdens with them and they might be able to share their burdens with you. Can I say the best place to find people to help share your burdens is in the church? You say, well, I tried church one time, and man, it was full of messed up people. I know, right? Just like you. Now, the church is not, uh, I don't know, it's not a country club for shiny saints. It's a hospital for hurting sinners. Friend, listen to me. The best place to find help is among God's people. That's the reason why I want to encourage you right now. You'll see a number at the bottom of our screen. And I want you to go ahead and I want you to text. One of our pastors, one of our ministers is there. They're ready to talk to you. You'll see another number there where you could call. And I've got some folks that would love to be able to encourage you, pray with you, help you. You say, nobody knows. They may not know exactly. They may not can identify with the exact thing, but I'm telling you, they've faced discouragement too. They've been disappointed in their 
own selves and in others. Right now, reach out. You were never created to bear what you're bearing all by yourself. It's another reason why we have small groups around our church that meet. And currently, we're not able to meet in person, but there are many of them that are meeting in digital, virtual ways. And we look forward to the day that we can get back together and we can start meeting in a room together and sharing life together and praying for each other. Every single week, we have thousands of prayer requests that occur right here at Highland Park Baptist Church. And they are lifting each other up and encouraging and loving on each other. We have a lot of support groups that encourage each other too. Here's the reason why I tell you that. Satan's plan is always to divide and conquer. That's what he wants to do. Satan wants to divide every marriage. He wants to divide every family. He wants to divide every church. He wants to divide every community and every country as well. We read over in 1 Peter, a New Testament book, that Satan is like a roaring lion. And so his strategy is just like a regular lion. It is to separate weak uh, Christians and weak individuals from the safety of the herd and to attack them. And yet our strategy is to stick together. There is strength in numbers. We need each other. That is why every follower of Jesus Christ needs to be a part of a local church of followers of Jesus Christ. You've got to link up with others if you ever think you're going to find hope the church of Jesus Christ is offering something today that no one else can offer and that is hope friend listen to me any church that preaches Jesus offers hope in this hopeless time life's tough anybody who tells you different is a liar even those who follow the Lord, it's tough for them. But your attitude makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? There was another farmer that I heard about one time who had this mule. And it was an old mule. It was almost blind mule. And the farmer knew that he needed to put the mule down, but he'd had him for many, many years. And he, he just couldn't bear the thought of putting the mule down. And then all of a sudden, one day, something tragic happened. He had this old well that he wasn't using, and the mule fell down in the well. The farmer heard the mule crying, and he went over to assess the situation, and lo and behold, that's exactly what he saw. This mule stuck all the way at the bottom of this well. And so he thought, well, you know what? I, I really don't have any use for the well, and uh, the effort that it's going to take to get the mule out. I'll never be able to do it without hurting him. And he's old. He's had a good life. And so he went over and enlist, you know, he's, he, he got some of his neighbors to come in and bring some dirt. And so they decided they'd just go ahead and fill the well up and go ahead and bury the old mule at the same time. And so the first couple of shovels of dirt, they threw it down on the mule. And when it hit the mule, the mule became very frantic. And he, you know, he, he started crying even more. And then as they threw more dirt in, he made a decision. He decided he'd shake it off and step on it. And that's exactly what happened. The dirt would come down. It would hit him on the back. He would shake it off, and he'd step on it. Shake it off, step on it. Shake it off, step on it. And then all of a sudden, he shook it off and stepped on it so much, the next thing you know, he stepped right over the edge of that well. And he lived. Man, that's a great word. No matter what life throws at you, no matter how discouraged, you may even think you're the only one. You may be tired. You, 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 you may feel as though there's no peace, there's no hope, things aren't going to get better. Friend, listen to me. Shake it off and step on it. And you'll find that God has great hope and future that are waiting for you. It's what God's telling you today. Life throws a lot of dirt on you, doesn't it? Yeah. You going to quit? You going to give up? You going to shake it off and step on it. God's saying, get up. Take care of yourself. God says, look up. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Some of you are like, well, I've been asking for God to send a tornado. Hey, by the way, whoever said God send a tornado to speak to me in downtown Panama City, we need you to quit saying that. 
You don't need God to speak to you in a tornado. You don't need God to speak to you in a hurricane. God's already spoken to you in His Word. Dig in His Word. Get up. Look up. Link up. There are people that need you, and there are people that you need. Even if you feel like quitting, you can find hope. And hope's name is Jesus. God's only son, God in the flesh, left heaven and he put on skin like you and I. And he walked the sod of this earth like you and I. In every way that we've been tempted to sin, he was tempted, yet different than us, he didn't sin. That's the reason why when the price had to be paid for the judgment of our sin, Jesus was the only one that was worthy to pay the price. The only one to ever live a perfect life. He didn't have to. He chose to be obedient to God the Father. And he laid down his life so that you and I might have life. I'm not talking about physical life. Yeah, that's a gift of God. I'm talking about eternal life, spiritual life. Only God could choose to give life out of death. And that's what he did through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross his hands were nailed to the cross, carrying the sin debt that belonged to you and I. The Bible says that he took his last breath and they put him in a tomb. And yet three days later, he rose from that tomb victorious over death, victorious over the effects of sin, victorious over hell and the devil and all of his devilish schemes. And today, he offers hope to you. Do you know him as Savior and Lord? Have you ever surrendered your life to him? Friend, listen to me. You can do all the things I've said today. You can get up, look up, link up. But if you've never surrendered control of your life to Jesus Christ and put your faith and trust in him, what you're searching for you'll never find. It is only through Him. If today you are ready to give your life to Jesus, I'm going to invite you to bow with me in prayer right now. Would you do that? With your heads bowed right now, if you say, Pastor, my desire is to trust Jesus with my life, I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer. Nothing magical about these words, nothing supernatural about these words. Now, these words are merely putting into action what you're already believing in your heart. The Bible says the mouth that confesses Jesus Christ is Lord and believes that God raised him from the dead, that is the person, the heart that will be saved, forgiven of their sins. And so today, it's not about you putting your faith in a prayer, not a preacher, not a church. It's putting your faith in a Savior. Jesus. But if that is you today, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Don't say a word that you don't believe. Don't say a word that you don't mean. But if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, would you just say, dear Lord Jesus? That's right. The quietness, the stillness of your heart. You might even speak it out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I realize that I am a sinner. And Jesus, for the first time ever, I realize that today I'm lost. Life's not right. I have no hope. So Jesus, right now, I put my hope in you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, my faith is in you. I believe what the Bible says about you, that you are God. That you did live, but you died, and then you rose. I believe that, Lord. And right now, I surrender to you. Is that your prayer? Just say that. Jesus, I surrender to you. My desire is to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Friend, I'm telling you, listen, 
If that's the desire of your heart, then he has done just that. He has forgiven you. He has saved you. He is offering you hope. You say, does that mean my life's going to be perfect? No, far from it. But here's what it means, that even in the imperfect times of life, your hope, your future, your joy, they don't have to be robbed because they're not built upon the things of this world. They're found in the relationship that you have with Jesus. And I'm telling you, if today that's the desire of your heart, what we just prayed, he's kept his promise. And he lives inside of you. We'd love to be able to celebrate that with you. We'd love to be able to help you. You can see some numbers on the bottom of our screen. Text surrender today. You gave your life to Jesus Christ. You prayed that prayer for the first time ever and you meant that. Or you'd like to talk to somebody about what does it all mean? I'm thinking about it. I'm considering it. I got some questions. Text that word surrender right there to that number. 850 850- 366-3080. You can also call. We've got uh, counselors that are standing by waiting to hear your call right now. You can call 850-785-6530. They'll be happy to pray with you, help you. You say, well, Pastor, I'm already a follower of Jesus Christ. Knew that before I watched the program today, but I really need prayer. I really need direction. I need help. That's okay. Go ahead. Call that number. Text them. They're there, and they'll be happy to help you in any way they can and pray with you. We're now going to move to a time where you can respond. And we're going to move to a time where we can also give. Putting our faith into action by giving back to the Lord what He has blessed us with. And so today I would encourage you, be faithful. Those of you that uh, normally attend Highland Park Baptist Church, this is an opportunity for you to give your tithe and your offering Uh, You can see a number there. You text the words HPBC to 77977. And then it will give you a link. And you can go ahead and click that link. And it's so simple for you to get set up if you've not done that. But continue to give. You say, well, I don't really do things electronically. I had somebody tell me this week, you give electronically, that's the mark of the beast. (laughs) Well... (laughs) Oh, we don't even have time to talk about that today, but I can assure you that's not the mark of the beast, okay? Now, that's just a way that God has given us to be able to support the ministry that your church is doing, because ministry continues, even though we're not in this room. A lot of times we confuse it and think that ministry is not happening because services are not happening physically on our campuses. Oh, I promise you, that is not true. It could be argued that we're doing more ministry now than we were before, six weeks ago. But it takes money to be able to do that. It takes money to be able to support missionaries. For uh, 40,000 missionaries that our church helps support on a weekly basis. And so you give. Uh, You can also, you can mail in uh, your gift if you would like to do that, your offering. We also, Monday through Thursday, our church office area is not open, but right outside the church office we have a drop box, and there are folks that go out there and they get the offerings as they come in. But right now we can't allow somebody to come into the church lobby area. We're just following uh, the good directives, and we want to be a great neighbor again. And we want to set a great example for those other churches that look to Highland Park to be leaders. But you come, you give. Uh, and God will bless that. It's not about giving to your church. It's about giving to your Lord and entrusting Him to use it to bring glory and honor to His name. I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, Pastor Wayne's going to come, and he's going to lead us in a great old song today, and I know you'll be blessed by it. Lord Jesus, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, for those right now that are surrendering their lives to you. Help us, Lord, to be people who walk by faith, And thank you, Lord, that right now you are speaking so clear. Help us, Lord, to open up our ears and listen. Bless this tithe and this offering. And thank you, Lord, for this church that is so faithful to give. May the gift go further than it would ever go if it remained in our own pocket or our own bank account. And because of the giving, may countless souls be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus.
Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Oh, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my side, angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy. Whispers of love. Sing this with me. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Oh, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long in perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting. Looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Yeah, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Hey, so thank you guys for worshiping with us today. I know, I know a lot of you are like, man, pastor, we've gotten to where we're an hour on the nose. You know why? Because we ain't got all this silly singing going on. You know, when they quit singing all their stuff, then we nail it every single time. Uh, but anyway, I just say that because I don't want you guys to expect when we get back in here, we're hitting an hour every time. Uh, but anyway, don't forget a lot of different opportunities for you and your children and your students and college students and Pastor Carl, I know some of you tuned in this morning to his life group time. Just so many things that we're still offering where you can be plugged in that are outside of just what's happening here. This past week, I came home and my 12-year-old was running around the house. I got a wooden spoon. I've got a battery. And I'm like, what is going on? And uh, he was doing a virtual scavenger hunt with our middle school group and, uh, and, and Robbie Martin, our student pastor. So a lot of things that are still happening, and I would encourage you to get involved in that. Let me just say this. I know next Sunday is the first Sunday of May, but we will not be meeting in person. We will continue to meet the same way that we've been meeting online, and as soon as we get the green light. Well, who gives you the green light? I would say the Holy Spirit of God. Really, honestly, 
And we're going to follow in directions from what we're hearing from our Florida Baptist Convention, as well as those that God has allowed to be in leadership over us, our elected officials. And then we're just going to sit there and say, all right, Spirit of God, what would you have us do? And as soon as we feel it's comfortable, and, well, not comfortable, we don't never want you to be comfortable. As soon as we feel it's safe, we're going to invite you to come back. And uh, so next Sunday, that won't happen. Just know that. If you show up next Sunday, you'll not be able to get in the doors. If you break your way into the doors, we still got tasers, and we will tase you, okay? But I love you. Thank you for letting me be your pastor, and I pray you have a blessed week. Tune back in on Wednesday for our refuge service.